Hi everybody and welcome to another Titanic podcast episode and um, yes as you can tell um, my lights have been changed because I've got a brand new set of lights and they're so much better than my previous ones I'm not going to lie but yeah it's basically just with the scene changes and then also in the last episode I mentioned that it would have been the last one before before I would actually move on to the actual documentary itself but because I decided to do the documentary beforehand I thought that this one would be an opportunity just to have a proper sit down and just have a talk about it so this is going to be my last Titanic podcast and I hope you guys really enjoy this one and the story that's that's going to be told better prepare yourself because this is going to be an emotional roller coaster and a very co coincidental story but yeah until then hope you enjoy the interview so hello and i know i did this in intro before but welcome to another podcast interview of the titanic and of course the day of the interview that's going up today is of course the 110th anniversary since the titanic struck the iceberg which is the 14th of april but today to round off the podcast i thought that uh, i would tell another story with someone very special about a couple who actually met on the night of the disaster in very very coincidental circumstances so i am joined by brandon to talk us to more about it brandon thank you for coming on and hello hello thank you for having me Oh, you're welcome. It's absolutely a pleasure. And I, I, I was reading your like the book that you've um, written earlier, and I thought to myself, oh my gosh, what, what, what? How much of a chance it, is that really? Because um, I know that we didn't really look into um, other partner stories that you mentioned. I never thought it was coincidental, but it was a very emotional um, roller coaster ride as well. So definitely be looking forward to diving into that. But before we do, would you like to introduce yourself, Brandon, so uh, to talk about what you do and what's your interest in the Titanic? Uh, sure. My name is Brandon Whited. I'm from the U.S. I uh, live in the state of Virginia. I'm a trustee with Titanic International Society. Uh, we're a nonprofit historical organization founded in 1989. Um, we publish a quarterly journal called Voyage, uh, which contains a lot of original Titanic research. Uh, I myself am the author of Gilded Tragedy, West Virginia's Titanic Widow, which is a biography of first-class survivor Eloise Hughes Smith, and um, she's been a focal point in my personal research. Uh, my own interest is mainly in the passengers of the ship you you really can't go wrong with like loads of the passengers on the ship really and i right. found like like really a lot with the other interviews because um um with the others um i've interviewed i've interviewed like descendants of survivors and oh. all of them had like really fascinating stories and it's just yeah. so interesting about the stories that you never get to hear because uh, right. some stories that they were never touched on because when you think of the titanic you think about first class passengers and the big names like john jacob astor right. and um, benjamin guggenheim but never about the ones that th their stories were never told so yeah i mean the passenger stories are they are always really special yeah, and they're always going to have i a... like the ones you don't hear those are the ones i like or the, the ones you you don't really hear about Oh, I mean, I, I I would say that the most interesting uh, thing that I've um, heard was about oh, who who was the name? Um, um, there's a girl that um who was on the Titanic called Leah Ask, and um she was yeah. a third class passenger, and I interviewed her great granddaughter, I think, or great Shelley. Yeah, Shelley. Yeah, so yeah, yeah I know that's Shelley. It. Yeah, because yeah. we both know Shelley as well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, and she had a little boy named Frank. Yeah, who uh, they they were coming to my state, Virginia. Uh, they they settled in Norfolk, Virginia. It's yeah. it's funny because uh, the first time I talked to historian Charles Hawes, he said, "You know, you remind your voice reminds me of Frank Axe." Oh, really? <laughs> he said, "You have that Virginia accent, like Frank has." <laughs> 
so I thought that was funny. <laughs> oh, oh, that was so funny. I mean, that, yeah. that's just that sounds like it's a bit coincidental. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. But yes, anyway, uh, we're going to jump into like the podcast interview because we've got so sure. much to talk about, really, because we've got uh, got to talk about Eloise as well, especially with yes. um, in Gilded Tragedy. You mentioned her like a lot as well, but really fascinating life. But I never actually known much about her story. And of course, if you don't know who Eloise is, she was known as uh, Mrs. Lucian P. Smith. And that was how um, the pronunciation of her name was, because um, at the time, women were always known by their husband's names, especially during 1912. But it's so amazing when, when you think about you know the name of a person, but you don't know behind the story. And that was certainly in Eloise's case as well. Yeah, that was really the impetus uh, for writing the book. Uh, there had been a few things about her. She would be mentioned, you know, there'd be a paragraph here or there about her. But uh, as far as her entire story, it had never really been told. And uh, it was quite a story. So oh, I, I wanted mean to bring it out. I mean, like, it's a, such a great story, really, because uh, I read, like, the bits from start to finish, and it, she had a lot of coincidental stuff as well with the Astor family as well, which really yes. blew my mind. <laughs> yes, her and, her and Madeline, their lives were very parallel in, in a lot of ways, mm. a lot of tragic ways, yeah. Yeah, because you always have to think, really, that they're, they're both uh, teenage married women. Um, mm -hmm. They went on the same honeymoon and they were married about yes. the same time. And then yes. also they um, that they were also first class passengers on the Titanic as well, which is absolutely crazy. And by the sound of it, they, they sound like they became friends. They at least knew each other. Uh, um, Madeline uh, sent a telegram congratulating Eloise when her son was born um, because of course they both gave birth to sons uh, whose fathers had died on the Titanic and uh, there is it's still owned by the family there is a telegram that Madeline Astor sent congratulating her but it, it, de it definitely sounds like amazing really but then also it's just like a little bit of like a tragic story but then what is also strange really because um with Eloise and her second husband Robert so um yep. and I hope I got his name right Robert Williams Daniel he was also a That's first class passenger yeah yes. I, <laughs> he had almost had three first names <laughs> yeah <laughs> I mean, it's absolutely crazy, but it, it's really strange, though, because uh, most accounts from what I heard, they bumped into each other on the 15th of April um, when they were rescued aboard the Carthapia. But it's really interesting to see that they I, that was either it was only their first meeting or uh, they met before on the Titanic. Yeah, uh, we can't say for certain when exactly they first met each other. Uh... I do know they did become acquainted on the Carpathia. I mean, they may very well have seen each other, spoke to each other on the Titanic. Uh, but uh, he was noted as carrying her off the Carpathia to the arms of her father. Uh, she she was draped across his arms uh, when they arrived in New York. That was just so heartbreaking to read, really, in, in the book as well, because you, you n uh, never knew, really, um, what was going on behind the scenes. But you can imagine the feeling of the emotions that were going through them. But the yeah. story of Eloise, because we'll probably jump into Eloise's story first. But okay. uh, can you tell us a little bit um, at the beginning of her story? Uh, Eloise was born in Huntington, West Virginia in 1893. Her uh, father was a congressman. Uh, her, a lot of her family were very involved in politics. And so she divided her childhood between Huntington, West Virginia and Washington, D.C. Her family actually stayed in the Willard Hotel across from the White House uh, when they were in Washington, D.C. So she had a very privileged upbringing, you know, very, very much upper class. Uh, in January 1912, she had her traditional debutante reception where she came out to society as they put it at that time uh, it may have been at that point that she met Lucian or there's also the possibility they were already engaged by that time uh, either way uh, things really sped up in her life at that point uh, she came out to society in January she was married in February 
Uh, they departed on the Olympic for an around the world honeymoon. She discovered she was pregnant during that time and they made plans to return home to West Virginia. Um, Lucian was also from West Virginia. He was from Morgantown, West Virginia. And uh, unfortunately they booked the Titanic's maiden voyage uh, to return home on. Yeah, because um, that, that was like in the story really, because um, in like the story, not long after they went um, on their honeymoon, um, both of them, um, Lucian and Eloise, they traveled to um, Israel before they went to Egypt. And um, then um, when um, Eloise discovered she was pregnant, they headed to go back. But for Lucian, it was really tough because he thought, okay so i can either go on the titanic but if there's not enough room i will go either on the lusitania or the mauritania but um mm -hmm. luckily for him at least they managed to get the tickets um to board the ship from i can't remember if it was southampton or cherbourg but i have a feeling it's cherbourg but... they they did board at cherbourg yes ah yes yeah you were correct <laughs> and uh, yeah, they, they bought their tickets in uh, Monte Carlo. Ticket hold the ticket uh, salesman later remembered Eloise because uh, she was being funny at the time. She told him, uh, "We were on the Olympic when it lost its propeller. Let's hope that this time the ship doesn't sink." And yeah. uh, so that stood out. Yeah. And I mean that those are like really spooky words. Really, this right. make, makes your spine shiver almost. Right. Right. So, and um, when they went on, like, um, the ship from Cherbourg, um, the story went is that they, they just settled, but then there was an event on the night of when the ship hit the iceberg. They had an 11 course meal with the captain, but no one was very cheerful or happy for some reason. Um, yeah, they saw the dinner party that George Widener uh, had held in honor of Captain Smith. They were not actually guests of it. They were simply eating in the restaurant at the same time. And Eloise remembered the dinner party um, and said it actually wasn't very exciting is how she described it. it. It didn't seem to be particularly gay is how she put it. Um, but they remembered seeing it. They were possibly eating with, eating with uh, the Myers. Leela and Edgar Meyer is probably who they were dining with in there. Um, then they had coffee out in the reception room, uh, which the Titanic had the a la carte reception room outside the restaurant. So they went out there and listened to the band's music and had coffee until until Eloise went to bed and Lucian uh, went to the Cafe Parisienne to play cards. But then, of course, as well, um, on the night of the sinking, um, there's a story that goes that um, Eloise felt the iceberg collision. Then she went back to sleep. And then she suddenly sprang, woke up when she realized that the engines had slowed and then stopped. Yeah, there was a couple of versions of it. Uh, I'm thinking in her affidavit, she says, you know, she wasn't alarmed. She kind of just woke up and then fell back asleep. But uh, her great nephew said that uh, she said she actually got up and went out to try to investigate and uh, met Lucian in the hallway as he was coming back. And uh, so there's, there's a couple of versions of how it happened, but she wasn't wasn't overly alarmed by it. It doesn't sound like. No, it, it didn't really sound like it to begin with, really. But it uh, I, it's so heartbreaking when she had to say goodbye to him, because um, yeah. from what I read in the book, um, she saw him eating an apple and then um, she we didn't want to get into a lifeboat so um trying to convince her to actually uh, go into the lifeboat and uh in the, i'm going to actually read uh, the famous quote in your book um uh, okay. Brandon, because um it is such a powerful quote and i know i've yeah. heard it so many times and it still like really breaks my heart but um yeah. after the captain actually said no your husband can't go on lucian actually said which was quote in the book i never expected to ask you to obey but this is the one time you must it is only a matter of form to have women and children first the boat is th thoroughly equipped and everyone on her will be saved yeah wow like you cannot really imagine what she must be going through at that point really no no yeah he he uh he told a little white lie 
to get her into the to get her into the boat. Uh, you know, self sacrificing statement. You know, mm. on his part. But he really, it sounds like they really did love each other, but then also at the same oh, time. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he was definitely her love for certain. Uh, she's even buried under the name Smith. So yeah. all those years later. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, it's yeah. just so crazy to think that she, she was still in love with him. But then there was one really sad story at, and when, when she got into the lifeboat and um, she ended up being in lifeboat number six in the end. But one historian who I came across, she actually nicknamed the boat the suffragette boat. Um, because oh. um, they they got all like the women who uh, were in the suffragette movement, like Molly Brown and her, Helen Churchill. And uh, there yep. was this one Helen section. Kindy. Yeah, and there was, was one section I can remember that um, when the boat was lowered away, Eloise saw Lucian standing at the handrail at the, I think it's the bow of the ship, like at the back. Uh, she said she could see him for a bit. Uh, he was standing with Edgar Meyer because uh, Edgar's wife, Leela, also got into the boat with Eloise. Uh, they were friends. And uh, she, uh, I don't know if you know about Leela, but she was on her way home to attend her father's funeral yeah. and ended up losing her husband also in the sinking. Uh, she said she could see them standing together for a while. And uh, as they pulled away in number six, she thought she could see Lucian, you know, darting along the deck, helping people in the boats. But it's, it's probably, you know, it'd be very difficult to discern him on the deck on that night. She probably saw me and walking around and kind of in her mind thought it was him. But yeah, she uh, she tried to keep her eyes on him as long as she could. And then, of course, uh, as well, Lucian went down with the ship. Right. And, um, Eloise was just so his uh, hysterical, really. She really, I don't know what like the words to say, really, but um, she uh, remembered like things that were really haunting into her mind, really. And when she got on the Carthapia, she 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 just really couldn't uh, get over her grief really because um she was angry with people especially with the captain and of course robert hitchens who some people actually debate about if he was like the good sailor or the bad right. sailor and um yeah he has his defenders uh most people did not care for him the ones who actually came in contact with him eloise absolutely loathed him and she she spoke very very poorly of him as did leela meyer and and margaret brown uh, you know they all most in the boat did not have anything good to say about him no i mean it, it's really interesting when you think about it really because there are some people who actually have a devil's advocate to his behavior because um yeah. he people just think he's just recently got married and um for what for what i can remember and uh, he cares about the safety of the people but then it's debatable because you really cannot tell in the perspective of what's going through his mind or what other people think and whether it's a case of what you believe or not or maybe the things have taken like on the wrong turn or with the wrong facial expressions it's interesting it's really interesting yeah i think to some degree he comes across as panicked or he always did to me he comes across as quite panicked and he was also you know he was a uh, tough he was a tough sailor suddenly in a small boat with a bunch of first class women it's uh it's a volatile combination of people there <laughs> So, you know, I think there was a lot of personality conflict as well, you know. See, he had never, I mean, he had never been around, you know, women of that, you know, of that uh, social standing, probably. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it was, uh, it was a combination, I think, of things that uh, definitely didn't paint him in a good light that night. I mean, it's like you're going through the different stages of grief, really, when you actually um like um go through it stage by stage and then also it just led to the fact really that eloise was probably never the same again after that no she wasn't no, no. But, then, but then it's so interesting really because um with robert as well we're going to probably move on to him a little bit but because um, okay. robert 
he he's just a really fascinating character really i always find yes. as well like ella Weese. and his story was completely the opposite but i always found that his story was a case of yellow journalism he's yeah he's hard to pin down um in doing the lengthy article of randy bigham and rich edwards you know we went back and read as many uh interviews and supposed interviews with him as we could find and they are so contradictory um nothing is clear you can really get a headache uh trying to read a lot of these accounts that have been attributed to him back to back it's it's almost it'll almost make you pull your hair out and it leaves him being you know a very mysterious uh survivor in some ways because i don't think we'll ever really know how he escaped i mean it's really interesting because um you know because normally um because he and eloise have bumped into a few times from what i believe um robert actually um um did he yeah, I think he did actually um, go from Southampton um, on the 10th of April and then he took his prize dog with him and apparently um, his prize uh, champion dog and um, second class passenger Eva Hart always had a love of Robert's dog yep. and uh, that um, made her feel a bit better because apparently she was like she was missing her dog because since she was emigrating with her parents they had to leave the, her dog behind with her grandparents and mm -hmm. um, and, and she, uh, the little dog just cheered uh, her up really so um, yeah. he was dad was like right since you love that dog so much when we get to america we're gonna get one of the dogs for you uh, the, the same breed so yeah so that's how it happened but then it's really interesting to know what happened at the night of the sinking because what happened was that apparently the dog was with him, but then um, there was a, a woman, um, I can't remember the name of the woman, but I think, I don't know if she was an aunt or if uh, it was a friend, but it could be one way or the other, but um, they actually- Edith Russell? Yeah, Edith, yes, Edith Russell, Edith that's Russell. the one. Yeah, yeah, yeah so- uh, She was they, a friend. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, I remember that. I, f I forgot yep. really which one it was. So he and Edith um, actually uh, found out, uh, tried to figure out what's wrong with the, the ship and all of that. And then, of course, the dog panicked, but sadly he didn't survive. But this is the, where this is gets interesting because there are different few accounts to how he actually he actually made it because there was one account saying that um, he he was um like stripped naked and then he died naked. into the water <laughs> I yeah. wish I thought, it's no. just mad there's no way <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's no way he was there's no way he was completely naked um i mean he couldn't have lasted in 28 degree water uh after he and eloise married there was actually a story that came out that uh she pulled him into number six that's another variant on it um of course, it, he was not in number six. They never reported pulling anybody uh, out of the water, uh, let alone a naked man. Uh, somebody would have remembered that. Yeah. Uh, you know, and Eloise never claimed that at all. Uh, but interestingly, one side of her family today still believes that story. Oh, really? Um, yes. Uh, her great nephew, her late great nephew, who helped me with the book, he said that was what he was always told was that Robert was naked with just his dad's watch around his neck, came up with his arms outstretched. Eloise pulled him in the boat and wrapped him in her furs. Uh, of course, that, that just didn't happen. Yeah, it just That's didn't happen. That's really interesting. Cause, um, yeah. It, yeah, it's just a case of like, um, uh, like a game of telephone or um, in England we call it Chinese whispers. And yeah. um, it, it's just the case of that that happened with a newspaper, but I never knew that someone would actually believe in that story. But of course, you've mm -hmm. got to think about really if the tragedy has traumatized a relative, especially if there was one of survivor, then you may not hear most of the parts of the story then. Yeah, it was invented after they got married because, you know, it was it was seen as so romantic that these two survivors ended up getting married and so i'm sure it was an extra detail to uh you know kind of push it even further like oh well she saved him she saved his life you know mm -hmm. and through the years it's become at least in that side of the family it's become oral history 
whereas it was a newspaper invention. Yeah. I mean, it's just absolutely incredible. But of course, then they got married um, two years later. Yes. And Eloise um, had her son uh, through Lucian. Uh, and of course, I don't know if it was right, but I think he was called Lucian Jr. I think uh, he was he was he was called Lucian Philip Smith II. second. Yep. Yes. Yep. Named, um, named after his father. Yes. Yeah. And uh, from what like I understand really, um Robert became like a stepdad to him as he well. He did. But you can't you can imagine what's going through Eloise's mind really if she did love Robert or she said, Oh, okay, um Lucia needs a father figure to look up to. Maybe let's like a little close thing. You just don't know what's going through in the Yeah, mind. we we can't really say for certain about the intimate details of their relationship. Um uh, it was very hard for a woman not to be married in those times uh, you know it really was uh, they seem to have got what little we know they seem to have gotten along uh, and Robert actually seems to have been a good uh, father figure to Lucian uh, you know there's pictures of him playing with him and uh, when World War One broke out you know I have the image in my book where they both have their uniforms Lucian's got his little uniform on and Robert's got his World War One uniform on they're saluting each other uh, so he seems to have been a good figure a good father figure at the very least we can say that oh yeah definitely I mean it's it's always special to have something like that and then of course um they ended up getting divorced yes it's really shocking to see how they actually met on the Titanic, got married and then got divorced really. But of course, it's um, it's just like a little bit tricky. And both of them went on to remarry again from what I understand. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, he remarried twice more, if I'm thinking correctly. I know she remarried twice more and um, he remarried at least once more right off the top of my head. I kind of have COVID brain right now so <laughs> it's hard for me to pull it back out I know he married at least once more no he married twice more it's coming back to me now he did he married twice more yes and uh had two more children he had a daughter and a son uh his son like him became a Virginia senator later on and uh he was named Robert Williams Daniel Jr. <laughs> oh what a funny coincidence <laughs> Yeah. Oh yep. wow. So they both they both did. They both remarried twice and both died in nineteen forty. No way. Well. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yep. They both died in nineteen forty. Oh wow. Eloise and Robert. Uh he outlived her by just a few months. Oh that that's really spooky. That's really coincidental, really. And I, I cannot really imagine with the story between the two of them, it's so it's just so spooky in a way when you think about how uh, they have like similar things as well but mm -hmm. it, it just makes you think really the world can be a really strange place really if uh, there are things that uh, involve coincidences really and I think what's fascinating about Eloise's story as well as Robert's that um they're just two different people really but it's it's really interesting to see because you don't get so many stories about how a, a soon to be married couple would meet uh, during a disaster that sounds like it's rare and it's more rarer to um say for example um or when the men survive because most men didn't survive the disaster in a way right um yeah, they're definitely unique in the Titanic story because they're the only two survivors who married afterward who were not romantically linked before the crossing of the Titanic. Um, and yeah, Robert, you know, he he never would talk about the Titanic. Uh, and that just really added an air of mystery to how he escaped because he really never would talk about it. Um, according to his daughter-in-law, at some point he did confide to someone in the family that he went into the water. That was about all he would say. Uh, he, even in the newspaper archives, uh, combing them for interviews with him, he never spoke of it in the press. At least none of it survived. After 1912, there's nothing. There's, there's not a word, even in his obituary, it's not noted that he survived the Titanic. 
uh, when he became a congressman or rather a senator, he became a senator. It was never noted he was a Titanic survivor. Uh, it, it was a, it was something that he did not uh, mention ever again. It's really understandable, Ray, really, because you, you just been oh, through yeah. a disaster and you just don't want to talk about it because it's traumatizing. But I know that Eloise, she gave a lot of testaments and a lot of newspaper interviews. Mm -hmm. I was thought that Eloise was a bit more open about the disaster. She surprisingly was. Uh, she was a very uh, vocal woman. You know, she would speak her mind uh, is the impression of her I get. And uh, she, you know, a lot of people would think she probably wouldn't want to talk about it ever again, but it was actually the opposite, especially later in her life. She started giving lectures uh, on the Titanic and talking about what she experienced. And there was a rumor that maybe she was writing a book about it, but uh, there's, there were no known notes or anything like that that she had started, at least none that survived uh, to this day. But uh, she was surprisingly open about it. It was probably cathartic to her to talk about it. Yeah. It did sound like she was very enthusiastic to talk about it, really. But it just makes you really think, really, just talking about her thoughts and opinions, especially in one of the cases, really, because um, I know you mentioned in Gilded Tragedy, um, Oh, what was it that she looked away and when the ship split in two because she never really said um if the ship broke yeah. in half she never specified if uh you know she saw it sink intact or if she saw it break apart at least not in anything i've found so i thought maybe she may have looked away uh, i think it's very possible a lot of people you know covered their eyes or looked away uh, she just never really said for sure and it's so like really really um interesting as well because and i know you have a strong connection to her but how did the book came about um what did you um find some notes on it because i know that in uh your book uh brandon you actually mentioned um oh what what was it um you actually mentioned that your interest in the titanic began um with either the discovery or the james cameron movie or another movie uh it was a little probably about a year before the james cameron film i actually found uh i was probably 10 years old at the time i found this uh pop-up book of shipwrecks at a at a store and uh toward the center it had this uh pop-up of the titanic sinking and it completely captivated me I, I couldn't believe that that had actually happened. That was that was really what started my interest. Um, as far as the book itself, um, I happened to be in Huntington around early 2012, and I looked up where Eloise was buried and visited her grave. That was the first time I visited a Titanic survivor's grave. And um, I, I, up to that point, I didn't realize how close Huntington was to me it's only a couple hours from where I live and um, so I started looking up things on her and there wasn't much in the books about her just you know a paragraph here and there so I started going back to the newspapers and finding more and more on her eventually that led to an article I wrote an article on her and I thought well I, I've told her story pretty good now then I kept finding things and kept finding things. And I said, you know, I've got so much. Uh, if I really want to tell her story, I'm going to have to write a book on her. And uh, that led eventually to me meeting her family and uh, befriending her granddaughters. And uh, which that opened up an entire, you know, entire world of information. Also, her great nephew I happened to come in contact with and uh he became a good friend. He is he has since passed away, uh, but he his dad knew Eloise very well, and he he passed on everything that he knew his dad had told him about her. So that was also you know, a phenomenal help. It's amazing to have like all of those connections. Well, and of course, really with Shelley as well. Um, there's an also another Titanic connection. But right. I'm really curious to know if you had to write any other book about a survivor. Who would you write about and why? I would like to write about Robert. Um, I don't know if enough information could be found on him, really. He was such a private man. Uh, I actually spoke with his daughter-in-law about, you know, maybe working on a, a book together at one point because she was interested in writing about him as well. Um, 
but probably Madeline Astor would be one. I would love to. I would love to see a full length biography of Madeline Astor. She's probably my second favorite, which is funny since she's got so much in common with Eloise. But uh, she's another very tragic figure. Who, uh, yeah, I would. I would. I would love to see a full length book on her. I just think that's really interesting to have so many stories that have been like told. But I was it's really interesting to see the differences between fact and fiction and i recently started reading a book about um in the perspective of the two um novel twi- uh, not novel twins uh like novel brothers uh, michelle and i can't and edmund oh, Mont. yeah, Mont, edmund, yeah. Yep. and um what was it um and the story told in the perspectives of their mother and um oh. the lady who actually looked after them not long after the sinking margaret and, hayes yeah that's it margaret hayes that's the one yeah and um it's really interesting to see um because i know that um um celia Iring, who um, i can't really pronounce the surname right but um if anyone doesn't know she's like a famous actress who actually been in films like Britta jones's diary and um she's done a lot of um like great work as well but i never knew she could write but it's really interesting to see that even though she's not related she's done like um amazing detail of research especially since um the place where the brothers were born she has a strong connection to them and that really blew my mind oh wow okay yeah yeah i think i saw something about that book um i haven't read it but uh yeah they they have a very interesting story I mean, it, it's so really, it's so spooky to actually think that when you actually talk about like some of the stories and how they've been told or they want to be told, and uh, each story just pops up every single time. But if you had to read a book that was written by a descendant of a survivor, a historian, or um, just an author who has no connection to both, which one would you choose? Oh, I'd love to read, uh, you know, something from a descendant. Uh... That would be my preference, especially one who was very knowledgeable, uh, like Robert's, uh, Robert Williams Daniels' uh, daughter-in-law. Uh, she's, you know, she has his letters and everything, and uh, she had talked about maybe doing a book on the family's history. And yeah, I think that would be amazing because uh, you'll you'll get details from families that you won't get anywhere else. Mm. They, they know the little things about them that nobody else would ever know. I mean, it's it's always um, really special. And um, it's it's really interesting to see how like people actually um, keep private stuff as well. Because I recently went um, to a Titanic museum because um, they had like an exhibition that's going on in London. And at the time, um, there were some items that did belong to people which were either loaned by descendants or from private collectors as well. And it's got me really interested in thinking about how amazing it is to keep so many good artifacts but it's also worrying about the history of them especially if um there's a descendant of a survivor who wants to hold on to them really because they're just a bit worried about what's going to happen to the item that belonged to a survivor right um i'm blessed enough to actually own a couple of pieces that belong to eloise um yeah uh through the very gracious kindness of uh, one of her granddaughters uh, one is a uh, invitation to her uh, debutante reception and uh, one is a black bordered uh, piece of stationery she would have used at the time of lucian's death and i own a postcard she wrote uh, while she was visiting mexico toward the end of her life uh, so i've got some of her handwriting as well uh, very very fortunate to have those things we're gonna actually round up um, the interview in a minute um but okay. before we actually um finish i've got one special question and this sure. is a question that i've been asking so many people and i know that the opinions of it is really interesting but in your perspective brandon how do you think the titanic should be remembered hmm. uh to me i think the best way to remember it is to remember the people who were there and uh, to always remember that uh, they weren't 
fictional figures, you know, some of them have become almost mythic, like Molly Brown is almost a mythic figure now, but I think the best way to remember them is that they were human. There were no, there were heroes that night, but there really weren't villains. Um, there were just people making decisions. And um, I think remembering them as flesh and blood is, uh, is the best way to carry it on. Uh, well said I actually couldn't agree more and especially as well um with the 110th anniversary since the collision of the yeah. iceberg it's so important to, to hold on to these words and to to treasure them really and I think when it comes to April the 15th which is tomorrow it's going to hit you so hard that you just think how important um history can be and how important everything can be really but yeah, I, I definitely think that that was very well said, Brandon. And uh, yeah, with that, we're going to probably end it here. Brandon, thank you so much for coming on today. Oh, thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. Oh, and um, do you know um, how people can find your book? Uh, it's available on Amazon.com, uh, both the US and the UK versions of Amazon, all the versions of Amazon. You just go on and search Gilded Tragedy and uh, it'll come up. Oh, brilliant. Oh, definitely. Um, uh, it's definitely good. And also, I would recommend reading it, especially if you are interested in more about Eloise's story. So yeah, I would definitely highly recommend reading that book. And yes, yeah, so okay. that rounds up for all the interviews. And yeah, thank you so much for um, coming on. And also, thank you so much to um, the wonderful guests as well who've been coming on. And until then, thank you. And yeah, I'll see you very soon. Uh, take care. Bye. Bye bye.